स्ट्रक्चर्स and the internal genital organs are divided into the uterus vagina fallopian tubes and ovaries external genitalia uh, the mons pubis is a fatty rounded area overlying the pubic symphysis after puberty this area is covered with the pubic hair uh, running posteriorly from the mons pubis are the two elongated hair covered fatty skin folds which are called as the labia majora these are the female counterpart of the female uh, male scrotum Uh, the labia majora uh, includes the labia minora which are the two thin hair free skin folds the labia minora includes a recess called as the vestibule which contains the external opening of the urethra more anteriorly followed by that of the vagina just anterior to the vestibule is the clitoris which is a small protruding structure composed of erectile tissue It is wooded by thin folds called as the prepuce of the clitoris, formed by the junction of the labia minora fold. As you can see in this diagram, uh, uh, the here uh, this area is called as mons pubis. Uh, these two large folds are called as labia majora. Uh, the inner one are called as labia minora, and this whole area is called as vestibule. Uh, the upper opening is called as uh, urethral opening, and this opening is called as vaginal orifice or vaginal opening. And above the uh, uh, urethral opening, this uh, small uh, structure is called as uh, clitoris, which is covered covered by two thin uh, folds, which is called as prepuce of the clitoris. Uh, the clitoris is richly innervated by the sensory nerve ending sensitive to the touch and it becomes swollen with the blood and erect during sexual stimulation contributing to the female sexual arousal the clitoris has a corpora cavernosa but not any corpus uh, spongiosum uh, now uh, we will discuss the internal genitalia uh, first of all uh, the uterus Uh, the uterus is a hollow pear shaped organ with thick muscular walls in young nelliparous adults it measures about 8 cm in length 5 cm in width and 2.5 cm thick uh, the uterus is divided into three parts the fundus body and the cervix the fundus uh, of the uterus is the part that lies above the entrance of the fallopian tubes the body lies below the entrance of the fallopian tubes and the cervix is the narrowest part of the uterus it pierces the anterior uh, wall of the vagina and is and it is divided into the supra vaginal and vaginal uh, part of the cervix as you can see in this diagram uh, above this is called as the fundus of the uterus these are the fallopian tubes so the part above the fundus is called as, uh, above the fallopian tube is called as the fundus and the part below the uh, fallopian tube is called as the uh, body of the uh, uterus and uh, this is the cervix uh the cervix communicates with the uterine cavity through the internal os and it communicates with the vagina through the external os uh the uh, cavity of the uterine body is triangular in the coronal section but it is uh, merely a cleft in the sagittal plane uh in the nelliparous woman the external os is circular but in the parous woman the external os becomes a transverse ridge so it has an anterior and posterior ridge Uh, the uterus is composed of three layers, uh, which are called as uh, the outer one is called as perimetrium, which is a part of visceral peritoneum. The middle one is called as myometrium, which is a thick muscular wall, uh, and it forms a bulk of the uterus. And the inner one is called as uh, the inner lining of the uterus is called as the endometrium, which is a highly vascular mucosa. Uh, then there are the ligaments of the uterus. Uh, 
the ligaments of the uterus include the round ligament, which is a remnant of the vernaculum, uh, the broad ligament, which is a sweetening peritoneum that overlies the uterus and the uh, ovaries anteriorly. Uh, the broad ligament is further divided into three parts, mesovarium, mesometrium, and the mesosalcine. Mesovarium covers the, uh, uh, is the part of the broad ligament that covers the ovaries. Mesosalcine uh, is the part of the broad ligament that covers the tubes. And the mesometrium is a part of broad ligament which is attached to the uh, uterus. The cardinal ligament uh, attaches the uterus to the uh, cervix, and the uterosacral ligament uh, attaches the uterus to the uh, to the sac sacrum. So, in this diagram, you can see. Uh, these are the layers of the uterus. Uh, the outer one is called as perimetrium. The middle one is a thick muscular layer, which is called as myometrium. The inner lining of the uterus is called as endometrium. And uh, this is the broad ligament. Uh, so uh, uh, I will al also tell the uh, relations of the uterus here. Uh, the uterus uh, is related anteriorly to the uterovesicle. Uh, pouch and the uh, superior surface of the bladder and the, uh, the posteriorly the body of the uterus is related to the pouch of the uterus. Laterally, the body of the uterus is related to the broad ligament of the uterus, uh, broad ligament and the uterine artery and the vein. Uh, the supravaginal cervix is, is related to the ureter as it passes forward to enter the bladder. And the vaginal cervix is related to the lateral fordings of the vagina. Uh, the uterus is supplied by the uterine artery, which is a branch of the internal ileic artery. Uh, the uterine artery reaches the uterus by running medially in the base of the broad ligament. It crosses above the ureter and at the right angles and reaches the cervix at the level of the internal os. Then it runs uh, along the lateral margin of the uterus and anastomosis with the ovarian artery, which also supplies the uterus. Uh, the uterine vein uh, also drains in the internal ileic vein. Uh, the lymphatic supply of the uterus uh, is divided into the two parts. Uh, the fundus of the uterus drains into the para-aortic nodes and the body and the cervix drain into the internal and external aortic nodes. And the uh, 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 sympathetic and parasympathetic from the inferior hypogastric plexus uh, is the nerve supply. Uh, after uterus, the uh, vagina is a muscular tube that extends upward and backward from the vulva to the uterus. It is about eight centimeter uh, in length and has anterior and posterior wall. At the upper end, the anterior wall is pierced by the cervix, uh, which projects downward and backward into the vagina. The upper half of the vagina lies above the pelvic floor and the lower half lies within the perineum. The area of the vaginal lumen which surrounds the cervix, it is uh, divided into the four forenses, which are called as anterior, posterior, right lateral and left lateral. The vaginal orifice in a virgin uh, has a thin causal fold, which is called as hymen. And after child, but the hymen consists of only tags. Uh, vagina is supplied by the vaginal artery and also a vaginal branch of the uterine artery. Vaginal veins drain into the internal eyelid vein. Uh, and the lymphatic supply of the vagina uh, is divided into the three parts. Drainage. Sorry, the lymphatic drainage of the vagina is divided into three parts. The upper third of the vagina drains into the external and internal eyelid nodes. The middle third drains into the internal eyelid nodes, and the lower third drains into the superficial inguinal nodes. And uh, uh, vagina is also spread by the inferior hypogastric plexus. Uh, ovaries. Ovaries are two in number. Each ovary is oval shaped, and each ovary measures uh, 1.5 into 0.75 inch are two into four centimeter. The ovary lies against the lateral wall of the pelvis in a depression called the ovarian fossa. It is bounded by the external eyelid vessels above and the internal eyelid vessels behind. Uh, the ovaries are surrounded by a thin fibrous capsule called as the tunica albuginea. This capsule is covered externally by the modified area of peritoneum called as germinal epithelium. Each ovary is attached to the back of broad ligament by mesovarium. 
Uh, that part is broad ligament extending between the attachment of the mesovarium and the lateral wall of the pelvis is called as suspensory ligament of the ovary. The round ligament of the ovary connects the lateral margin of the ovary. Um, ovary uh, is supplied by the ovarian artery, which is a branch of the abdominal aorta. Ovarian vein drains into the inferior vena cava on the right side and the left renal vein on the left side. Uh, the lymphatic drainage of the ovary is para aortic nodes at the level of L1. And uh, its nerve supply is derived from the aortic plexus and it accompanies the uh, ovarian artery. Uh, this is the, uh, uterine tube. the uterine tubes are about uh, 10 centimeter long and lie in the upper border of the broad ligament. Uh, the parts of the uterine tube include uh, infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus, and the intramural part. Uh, the infundibulum is the uh, most lateral part of the uh, tube and it has uh, fan shaped uh, fimbria. The ampulla is the widest part of the tube. The isthmus is the narrowest part of the tube. And the intramural part is the part of the tube uh, which is uh, 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 which, which is uh, close to the uterus, which enters the uterus. Sorry. Which is within the uterine wall. Which is, which is the uterine wall. Uh, uterine tube. Is, uh, fallopian tube is also supplied by the uterine artery, ovarian artery, and the veins correspond to the arteries. Uh, uh, the lymphatic drainage includes internal ilic and para aortic nodes, and uh, it is supplied by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve from the inferior hypogastric plexus. Thank you. पार्टिसिपेशन स्क्रीन now you see uh, what uh, Tanab has told us is uh, about the salient points of uh, reprodu female reproductive tract anatomy. <clears throat> At this stage, in addition to the ये जो कॉर्नर वाला है इसको जरा मिनिमाइज कर देना अह एट एट व्हेन यू आर इनटू द क्लिनिकल सब्जेक्ट इटसेल्फ यू आर देन कंसर्न विद व्हाट इज नोन एज अप्लाइड एनाटॉमी हाउ दैट एनाटॉमी ट्रांसलेट्स इनटू अह इट्स फंक्शन एंड आल्सो हाउ वी हैव टू टेक केयर ऑफ इट एट वेरियस स्टेजेस say during operation or whatever and also how the changes take place during various phases of say menstruation or pregnancy and how the the uh, uh, pelvic tract uh, uh, female pelvic tract uh, uh, adapts to uh, the various situations now yedra light samne wali off kar de this is something which all of you must have seen at the time of surgery. You see, this is the common thing that you see either at the time of laparoscopy or even at the time of laparotomy when we have performed hysterectomy, say, or whatever operation that is to be done here. You see, this is the, now we know that this is top of the uterus, this is the fundus. And here you can see the tube curling back and going back here. And here is the uh, ovarian ligament. The ovary is attached to the uterus on this side. And this here you see this ovary and here you see the other ovary. And you know, uh, the, uh, to understand the folds of broad ligament, I'm sure that when at assistance at the time of hysterectomy, you would have seen that when we hold the uh, and cut the round ligament and then we open up towards the uterocycle pouch 
and uh, uh, on the other side, and what opens is the broad ligament. We cut through the anterior uh, leaf of the broad ligament. This area is known as cul sac or mouth of Douglas, uh, because here lies the rectum, and in front of the uterus is the bladder. This is one of the specimens of uh, uterus. Here you can see where the round ligament was cut. And this is a posterior view because it shows the tube here and the ovary is, this is the anterior view, anterior part, because the ovary is or, or lies posterior to that. Now imagine the fold of peritoneum, which has been cut from here, that was coming down here and also going down on the, uh, the, the posterior surface. And that is the broad ligament, which goes on laterally to the pelvic wall. So that is broad ligament. And in its upper fold, the broad ligament has the tube. It has the meso ovarium, as has been said. It has the uh, parametrium, because these are the, uh, this is uh, the fold of uh, broad ligament, which has been cut here. And then in the base, because the broad ligament would be, uh, 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 would be spreading across anteriorly, uh, going uh, uh, anteriorly, and posterior would be sweeping from below upwards posteriorly. And the, the, it contains loose uh, cellular tissue or areolar tissue. And it also has other contents, blood vessels, nerves, et cetera. Those are there. And the important structure that we are concerned uh, at the time of surgery is also the ureter. Here uh, in this, uh, we left a little bit of uh, parametrium. And this is actually to show uh, the layer of the broad ligament, which was left here. In this, you see the fallopian, and uh, as Zainab explained, that this is the fundus and this. Cervix is different. Cervix is different in its uh, structure. Cervix is different in its function uh, and uh, during the menstrual cycle, as well as later on. Here, uh, uh, you see the uterine cavity and Part of the cervix is also protruding into the vagina. This part is known as portio vaginalis, that part which protrudes. And or, or this is also known as the vaginal part of the cervix. And the upper part is known as supravaginal cervix. The internal os lies above that. The external os lies below that cervical canal. And it has two areas of constriction above uh, which is communicating with the uterine cavity is the internal loss, and this is the external loss. Again, it is important here, one uh, uh, particular feature, that the vagina is lined by, lined by stratified squamous epithelium. The uterine cavity's endometrium has columnar epithelium. That columnar epithelium continues into the uh, cervix, and cervix has its own glands. Cervix does not go through a, a, a proliferative or secretory phase, although some changes do take place, but the cervical mucosa is not shed off as the endometrium is shed off during the periods. And uh, therefore, but there are glands and those glands do secrete secretions. Vagina doesn't have any glands, remember that. And the uh, vaginal discharge or the secretions in the vagina when I say vaginal discharge at this time, it is not pathological discharge. It is the normal secretions in the vagina, which are there as in all body cavities, which are exposed to surface uh, to keep them comfortably moist, not dry. Even our nostrils, you know, if they become dry, it becomes very uncomfortable. So all body cavities have some mechanism of keeping them uh, moist or uh, preventing them from getting dry. And in the vagina, the question for you to uh, explore is, what are the components of vaginal secretion? Secretions would be not, what are the contents of the vaginal discharge, normal vaginal discharge? What contributes that? Vagina doesn't have its own glands. So it comes from uh, uh, the, the, the cervical glands, and also shed of epithelium, which lyses, and uh, their are fluid of those, those cells that also contains that. And at the time of sexual arousal or at some other uh, times, 
the botulinum glands, the skin glands, which are paraurethral glands, they also pour in their secretions to create moisture or provide lubrication. Now, this is the area which is known as the fornix. On the sides would be lateral, because this is an area all around. This is not four compartments like interior, posterior, lateral, but that is only for description that we use that terminology. And Otherwise, it's an all around uh, area uh, into which the cervix is, and that is created by the projection of the cervix into the top of the wall. That's why in the time of hysterectomy, you would see that you don't have to go below where the cervix is being palpated. This, you, you, the, the vagina can be opened a little above that because the cervix would be uh, uh, projecting down. So you give NCN not here, but you give NCN to cut the or get an entry into the vagina over here. Huh? You see, at the time of surgery, when we apply clamps here, we do not go. We do not have to go too down, too too uh, low to cut or uh, get entry into the vagina. While you still can palpate the cervix, you hold the you 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 catch hold of this area with a clamp, and then you cut it, and then you can get access into the vaginal canal. Uh, three layers of the uterus, the uh, uh, endometrium, myometrium, and serosa. Myometrium is the thickest, and uh, it has crisscrossing uh, muscle fibers, the myometrial fibers, and serosa is the thinnest, which is the, the, the peritoneum, and endometrium, uh, last time it was explained that it has those, it goes uh, during reproductive life, undergoes uh, cyclical changes. And uh, then there are, this is the basal layer. This is the myometrium. If we look at the histology, this is the basal layer. And this is known, known as the functional uh, layer of the endometrium, uh, endometrium, which has the spongiosum or compactum layer. They're differentiated into that. This here is the compactum, spongiosum, and the basal layer. And this is the myometrium. Now, coming back again to the cervix, this is the internal loss. And what is its uh, practical application of the cervix? So cervix has glandular cells and it has squamous cells also. The Here, if you look at this diagram, the vaginal uh, epithelium is stratified squamous epithelium. So it continues like this and it covers the outer surface or the exposed cervix of the cervix also up till the roughly the external loss. So up to this area, the cervix is covered with stratified squamous epithelium. And from here onwards, the epithelium changes into columnar epithelium. This area where the epithelium changes, that is known as the transformational zone or junctional zone. And the significance of that is that since there is a lot of cellular activity and this epithelium is amenable to infection and the changes that can take place there and majority of the carcinoma of the cervix arises in this area. So the cervix has, endo, uh, histologically, it has endocervix, transformation zone and exocervix or ectocervix. Uh, this is the enlarged diagram here. And this is a good, uh, actually, uh, histological slide. Here you see the covoidal epithelium. And it is going on like this. And this is the transformation zone because this is typical stratified squamous epithelium. This is columnar and this is the transformation zone where it changes from Columnar to stratified squamous cell. Now, this is uh, in the external os area. This is the stroma here. This is the basal layer, parabasal cells, and this is the intermediate cellular layer, and this is the superficial layer. When you take a smear, cervical smear, 
the adequacy of the smear is denoted by a report from the histopathologist when he says that there are superficial squamous cells and also intermediate cells. So if you have that report, that would mean that the specimen was adequate for cervical cytology. So that is the significance of these intermediate cells and superficial cells, right? Now, this is a diagram which you should be able to uh, Okay. You yeah. And the urethra. This is the uterus. Mm. This is the rectum here. And here, this is the vaginal canal. Mm. And this is the sacrum. Right? Now, if you are to see here, The parietal peritoneum from the anterior abdominal wall comes down, is reflected onto the top of the bladder, and it goes down here, and then forming the uterovesical pole, it then is reflected onto the anterior surface of the uterine body. And here it is then intimately related. Whereas you know that from the, this area, which is the lower part of the uterus, you can pick up the, at this time of cesarean section or at the time of uh, hysterectomy, you must have seen that the peritoneum can be picked up from there. That is the part from where it is reflected from the bladder onto the interior surface of the uterus. And then it becomes intimately related. You can't really separate the peritoneum from the myelin from there. And then it goes up and behind. And then here it forms pouch of Douglas, and then it is reflected onto the anterior surface of the middle part of the rectum, middle third of the rectum. Now, the, this is the fold which is coming down and is covering here. The lateral part that becomes that becomes broadly covered. The lateral part of this where it has it is attached with the uterus, of course, but laterally. It is then unfolding the uh, fallopian tube and then is coming, and also the round ligament is coming here and it is coming onto the lateral pelvic wall, and that is the broad ligament. So, this is uh, something which you need to remember how the peritoneal fold goes on and how this is formed here. In this diagram, also. You see, the peritoneum would be coming down here. It's not shown in this diagram here, but it, it comes down here and then it is reflected onto the uterus, goes on there. In this diagram, you can appreciate that this is the fold of peritoneum interiorly. This is the round ligament which is going on to it. We generally pick it up here. This, this, is, uh, this is actually in front. This is only the back part of that because it is the posterior aspect of uh, the uh, uterus that has been shown here. This is uh, the ovarian ligament and the tube is folded. Just uh, the fibrillary length of the tube is free. It is not covered with that or there it is left here. This is the ligament of the ovary or ovarian ligament as we call that. This what is known generally as a suspensory ligament of ovary 
This also has a fold of peritoneum. And what we call that is infundibulo pelvic ligament. Infundibulo pelvic ligament. It is important to add uh, the, uh, the various parts of the tube. This is the intramural part, which is within the uterine wall. Then is the isthmic part, which is the narrowest part. Of course, intramural part is narrow, but isthmic part is the narrowest part in the tube, which is visible outside the uterus. And uh, this ampullary part is comparatively broad. And then, of course, the infundibulum. And this is the area where fertilization takes place. And then, of course, ovarian cortex and ovarian medulla. We talked about that in the last uh, uh, session. And uh, that part of the uh, uh, broad ligament, which uh, spreads from the uh, tube towards the ovary, that's known as uh, uh, mesosalpings. And this part where the ovary is attached to that, that is mesoovarium. And this is parametrium or mesometrium. And these three actually form a part of the broad ligament. So this is uh, the understanding that you should have about this. This again is the same, but it shows the relationship of some structures. This is the vagina rectum and the vaginal walls. Here the pubic symphysis and uh, the others. This is where the Bartholin's gland or vestibular glands are situated, this area. And their uh, duct opens into the lower part of the uh, uh, vagina or close to the uh, uh, hymenal opening. This is the ligaments. Uh, now we come to the sports of the uterus. This uh, diagram is an important one to consider uh, that there, these ligaments are localized condensations and thickening of the pelvic connective tissue. That a thickening which runs from the cervix towards the lateral pelvic wall here is known as cardinal ligament. And that part which runs backwards and is attached to the sacrum is the utrosacral ligament. And uh, uh, I'm sure that all of you must have seen utrosacral ligament clearly delineated at the time of hysterics. Now, close to the attachment with the cervix, cardinal and utrosacral ligaments are actually combined. So that's why when we clamp here, we clamp this area where the cardinal ligaments as well as the utrosacral ligaments, they are taken in one bite and cut, right? And at the time of cesarean, uh, at the time of vaginal hysterectomy or when we are doing uh, Manchester repair, then these are cut and they are then tied in front of the cervix so that they will have a backward pull towards this backward pull for the cervix to keep it, keep the uterine body anti -burden. I'll spend a little bit of time here. You just look at the vaginal canal and then the cervix here, the uterus. You will see that the uterine body is going like this. That is the plane of the uterine body. This is the plane of the cervical canal or cervix. And this is the plane of the vaginal canal.
Now, if the cervix is directed, no, directed towards the posterior vaginal wall, then if we call that anti-verted uterus. And that angle, when the uterine body is bent onto the or anteriorly over the cervix, that is known as anti-flexion. This angle is anti-flexion, and this angle is anti-version. Anti and if the This is the retroverted uterus, a retroflexed and retroverted uterus. This is the uh, position in uh, which is the norm for about 85 percent, and this is present in uh, about 10 to 15 percent uh, women. That's normal retroversion or retroversion. And uh, well, yes, there is another ligament which is not mentioned here. This is the place where the uterosacral ligament is. This is the uh, uterosacral, and this is the card. That's right. This is the cardinal ligament. And then there is what is known as pubo cervical fascia or pubo cervical because that's attached to the pubic surfaces and circles also. This is again part of the uh, Areolar tissue or connective tissue within the base of the broad ligament, which is uh, comparatively thickened in that area, and uh, that also helps. Now, if we are to look at the factors which cause most of the uterine to be antiverted, that is backward pull of the uterosacral ligament and uh, forward uh, slight fraction of the round ligament. That is what keeps the uterus in a Antiverted position. The cardinal ligaments, uterosacral ligaments, and pubic cervical fascia, they have a stabilizing effect of keeping the uterus in its normal position within the pelvis. When these ligaments they become lax, then the uterus or the cervix comes down, and along with that comes down the body of the uterus. So that is the mechanism of uterovaginal prolapse when the sports become lax. And one of the reasons for laxity of the these supports, in addition to a constitutional pre uh, uh, disposition, or some women have uh, softer connective tissue and they have greater tendency or of uh, having uterovaginal prolapse. But the other factors which can be there are important, and they are the trauma sustained during uh, the, the, the childbirth, and uh, particularly in that respect, if the woman is made to push down or bear down before the cervix is fully dilated. Because if the cervix is not full, fully dilated and she continues to bear down, the head then pushes the cervix onto downwards. And the cervix hasn't opened enough and uh, the, the, the head uh, is being pushed by the extra efforts of the woman bearing down and that brings down the cervix and causes excessive stretching of the ligaments. And that excessive stretching of the ligaments ultimately causes comparative weakness and uh, reduction in the uh, tenacity of the ligaments. Now, here diagrammatically, it is shown here. This is the bladder, this is the uterus, this is the rectum, and this is the uterosacral ligament, this is the cardinal ligament, or, or transfer cervical ligament is also the name of the. And this is the pubocervical ligament or fascia. So these are the ligaments which support the uterus, and uh, the factors which are responsible for its antiverted position are the uterosacral ligaments and the uh, uh, those are stabilizing cardinal ligaments because they are pulling sideways. But the uterosacral ligament that is important in the antiverted mechanism. Now, again, uh, technically, it is the ureter's uh, force in the pelvis, which is important. Ureter, total length of the ureter is about 20 centimeters, about half of which is within the pelvis. It enters the pelvis at the pelvic brim, 
and uh, there it crosses the bifurcation of the uh, common iliac artery bifurcation into external iliac and the internal iliac artery and it is a retroperitoneal structure goes down and medially goes uh, down and medially and then uh, in the uh, 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 base of the broad ligament passes close to the cervix about one centimeter lateral to the cervix and then it enters into the bladder but while it is uh, in the lateral part of the cervix, it traverses through the cardinal ligaments. So it makes a kind of ureteric tunnel within that. That's known as ureteric tunnel. Now, the practical implication of that is that when you are, and the uterine artery that is above that, uterine artery is coming from here. And in the next diagram, probably we we'll be able to see that. Here you see it is from uh, 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 from behind this picture. This is the sacrum, and that is the pubic symphysis. This is the bladder. This is the uterus, and here the ureter traverses, goes over the pelvic brim, and here you can see that it is close to the cervix, and uh, the uterine artery is crossing over it. That is the relationship that the water flows under the bridge. The bridge is the uterine artery and water flows through that. So if when we are to apply clamp to the uterosacral ligament or the cardinal ligaments, that is, which are the combined ligaments at that point. So uh, uh, if one is not careful, one can very easily either take the ureter within the clamp or cut close to that or cut the ureter as well. So one has to take precautionary measures. So therefore, what you do is at the time of hysterectomy, what you do at the time of hysterectomy that you strip the bladder downwards and you create area, you must have seen laterally also. When you push the bladder downwards, the ureters are also pushed laterally. Now, in case of uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy, you would have seen that when the uterine arteries are cut after having been coagulated, they fall sideways. They fall laterally. When they fall laterally, they also take away the ureter. So that's a kind of a good thing. But at the time of open surgery, when we cut the uh, ligaments like that, because of fear of uh, oozing and small amount of hemorrhage from that area, we do not take liberties with the particle, with the uterine artery particle. So we do not really push it sideways. But the trick is to remain close to the uterus. That's why uh, the specimens that I showed you of hysterectomies, the cervix is rather closely shaped, right? So uh, you remain close to the uh, uterus here uh, uh, and uh, thereby, you know, first is separate the bladder, push it back, and a little make space laterally also so that the ureters are pushed sideways, and then you apply the clamp to the ligaments. Now, ureters in the pelvis, again, this is important. This is the rectum, this is the uterus, and the green is the ureters here, and this is the artery. This, this green band is the uterosacral uh, ligament, and this is uh, what is known as the ureteric canal, ureter lies in the ureteric canal of the part of the ligament here. And this is the bladder. So if you push the bladder here and make space a little here, then you push the uh, ureter sideways. So that is the practical importance of this. Here you see the ovarian arteries crossing over the ureter. Then the blood supply, that is something that we can talk later on. Uh, important thing is that uh, the uh, Uterine artery is the branch of anterior division of uh, the internal iliac. It goes uh, on uh, from the side, uh, traverses upwards and keeps sending uh, here. And the ovarian artery, which is the direct branch of uh, the, the, the aorta, uh, that gets an osteomosis here. The importance of that you would see, particularly at cesarean hysterectomies or in cases of placenta failure. While uh, you still clamp the uterine artery, still there is so much of bleeding because there is so much of uh, 
uh, an osteomotic uh, 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 system here that uh, there is plenty of blood coming from the ovarian vessels as well. So therefore, sometimes you would have observed that we also uh, apply spawn forceps or atraumatic forceps to this area to occlude the ovarian arteries for a limited period of time. Here you see that this is going up and then it's meeting here and uh, they have this anastomosis here. And this is the vaginal artery coming down and also, and there, this is quite a muscular area. That's why one ought to be careful while you are pushing the bladder down and sideways, uh, don't do it without, uh, uh, it must be done under direct vision because if you are doing a kind of blindly just uh, uh, pushing a boss piece uh, uh, naturally, you can open up uh, quite a few of the tributaries of uh, or the branches of uh, the vaginal artery. And sometimes this, uh, because this also has uh, an osmosis, and many a times vaginal artery is a branch of the uterine artery. Here you see further anastomosis quite clearly and, and how richly supplied this whole area is. Here you, you see the close relationship of the ureter with the uterine artery. These are branches of the internal iliac. ये मैं आपको दे दूँगा कि ये आप internal iliac की जो branches हैं उनकी division जो है ये जरा देख लेना. There are two, four, four, eight, ten branches and two go back to the body wall, four leave the pelvis entirely, four to the pelvic viscera. Internal pudendal artery again is of significance because this is uh, what is supplying to the external genitalia, partly. And uh, in the ovaries, it, it's important to uh, know that both the ovarian arteries are direct branches of the aorta. And uh, the uh, right ovarian vein drains into the aorta, uh, um, inferior vena cava, whereas the left one uh, drains into the left renal uh, vein. And uh, this is is that a diagram is dali please? Jo text na uske saath diagram dala. Maine text nahi dala, maine diagrams dali nahi hai. So diagrams ke saath ye. It is important that ये कहाँ कहाँ पे lymphatic drainage होती है. When we are uh, considering malignancies of the uterus, body of the uterus, the cervix, because there, the approach, surgical approach will take into account the lymphatic drainage and that natural spread of the cancer, where they go. So therefore, the venous drainage, because the, the spread is direct or through the blood vessel or through lymphatics. And uh, uh, it, therefore, it is important uh, which lymph nodes or group of lymph nodes will be uh, affected by that or get uh, invaded by the uh, cancerous cells. So uh, this diagram shows that up to paraortic, because ovaries, uh, they, they spread early to paraortic nodes. The lower parts, they spread to these inguinal nodes, the pelvic internal iliac, external iliac, common iliac nodes, and so on. Then nervous supply. It is also important it is actually T10 to L1 voltage. That is one. And the next, this diagram is quite useful because it has T10 to L1. It supplies, you see here, the upper part of the rectum, the body of the uterus, bladder, part of upper part of the vagina. And then S2 to 4, Pelvic nerve or pudendal nerve, they supply lower part of the rectum, lower part of the vagina, urethra, and the perineum and the vulva. So remember T10 to L1 and S2 to S4. So that's why when you are to give uh, epidural analgesia or spinal anesthesia, which is the uh, level at which it should be given. So that is the practical implication of that. We haven't talked much about the external genitalia. We'll take that up later. It's already 8.30. Is lymphatic drainage, etc. Thank you. Now it is have some.
the uh, homework for anatomy is the practical applied aspects of anatomy in clinical situation. We haven't discussed uh, the behavior of the biometrium in labor. What happens to that? Uh, uh, what happens to the myometrium in the uh, during pregnancy? How it accommodates the pregnancy? Uh, different changes in the endometrium we discussed last time. Uh, sure. Yeah. More visible. Uh. Uh, next time we'll uh, 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 show the board as well, right? Or yeah, yeah. This thing I'll do again. I'll do it again. Okay. 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 What is the topic next?